Well, good morning again, and if you would, turn your Bible to the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 10, and see if we can get through chapter 10 this morning. It's always a noble effort. You never know uh, how it's going to go. Kind of, This is really a continuation of last week's message, uh, in a sense, the blessings of obedience. You know, obedience is something that we all like to see in other people. Amen? <laughs> but when you look in the mirror, sometimes you see someone that sometimes isn't so obedient, right? They can be a little stubborn, a little opinionated, a little strong-willed. Is that a more delicate way to put it? Um, that person you're looking at is their own man or woman, right? Doesn't sound quite so bad as disobedient, <laughs> as stubborn. <coughs> but the blessings of obedience, you know, in the last few weeks we've, we've been talking about Peter and we're going to continue. And, and you know, a couple of weeks ago, we, three weeks ago, we were looking, we talked about the persistence of the persecuted Peter. Peter was per persecuted. And he stuck with it. And all of us, at various times in our Christian walk and um, life, you, you, you've been persecuted. If you stood up for Jesus and in a setting, in a situation where, you know, maybe you might be the only Christian there. Sometimes it's like you might be the only person who doesn't laugh at certain jokes, right? Um, th that can happen. Or you're 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 uh, you're you're not the one to pile on when everybody else is dissing on the boss or the coworker who doesn't happen to be there, right? And people wonder like, what's up with 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 you? You know, why aren't you? So Peter knew a little bit about uh, being persecuted, and as we read through the book of Acts, we're going to continue to see in the early church. Like in the modern day church, persecution is big. Persecution is huge in our church today. I don't mean necessarily in this body, although we suffer at some, but I mean the church at large. Because Christians are being slaughtered at unprecedented rates around the world. All because they, uh, they want to stand up for Jesus, right? They want to, they want to worship the Lord. Just, you know, the one we, we sang about here... Uh, you know, they want to follow their vision, their vision of Christ. They, they want to follow the shepherd who's leading them. They want to talk to their friends and family and co-workers and neighbors and strangers and tell them the story of Jesus, right? That Jesus paid it all. And so that, my friends, will invite persecution. But it will also bring great blessing to you. Today we're going to, like I said, complete the message. And, and I love reading about Peter. Because when I read Peter's story, I'm reading my story, and I'm reading your story. Because I think he, he, he's reflected in so many of us. The Peter we're talking about here, we're going to read about here in Acts 10, is, is not the same one that we, that, that we were introduced to in John chapter <laughs> 1, you know. Where his brother says, hey, we found the Messiah. Come and see, you know. Come look at this. Check this guy out. He's matured. Just like we've all matured, right? Physically, but more importantly, hopefully spiritually, we're maturing. He's grown in knowledge and faith. You know, and we kind of mentioned this, I think, last week. Instead of denying Christ, you know, he's uh, rejoicing for being persecuted earlier in the book of uh, Acts. Him and John, right? He's told, shut your mouth, we don't want to hear you talking anymore about Jesus. And he's like, well, you can do whatever you want, but, you know, we're going we're gonna to keep telling people that Jesus is my vision. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I own. And he, and he turned my sin white. He, he took care of it. But God is getting ready to shake old Peter up here. I mean, he's already shook him a little bit. And the obedience here is a sign of his increasing faith. Your obedience to the word, 
to the Savior, to the promptings of the Spirit are a sign that you are growing and maturing in your faith. And not only that, but your usefulness. How many people here want to be useless? Say, man, I hope when I stand before God, he says, you are like the most unprofitable, <laughs> worthless uh, person that ever got saved. Is that what you want to hear? No. I mean, that almost probably sounds sacrilegious or bad to say that, but, you know, we want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah. Yeah. Right? You know, uh, if you do something, you want to do it well. If, if you're going to do Christianity, if you're going to do Christ following, I think you want to do it well. I hope you do. That is my vision for you anyways. Okay? But Peter, his old prejudices are dissolving in the fire of the Holy Spirit. I think that's part of what we read about here in Acts. That Peter's prejudices, his, his self-assuredness and what he thinks he knows is dissolving in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Think about that. And he's seen a lot so far, right? I mean, it's been a few years, I think maybe eight years, right, since the day of Pentecost. And, and Peter, Peter is still learning. He's in school, just like we are. So before we read the scripture, I want us to pray one more time. Father, we come before you, and Lord, I just ask that you will quiet my thoughts and my heart, and the people too, Lord so that we can focus upon what your Spirit has to say uh, to each of us individually and to us corporately this morning. Father, as we read Acts chapter 10, starting at verse 23, uh, we want to th we we learn, Father, what we can put into practice in our lives. We, we want to learn from the example of, of, of the Apostle Peter uh, and see how you led him, Father, and maybe you'll lead some of us in a similar way, and maybe not uh, around the world, but maybe here in Wolf Creek, and, and maybe in Helena, and, and maybe up uh, on the lake, and maybe in Great Falls. Lord, you can lead us and call us and, and do whatever you want with us because you're God. So help us to learn to be obedient, Lord, because that's what you desire to your people. Uh, to do it, and to do it immediately, like the kid's song says. And also for the blessings of obedience, Lord, not, not in a selfish, self-serving way, but in a way that the blessing of obedience is that our obedience in our Christian walk, Lord, will, will result in Christ being lifted up and glorified and, and exalted among the people, Lord, and, and souls will be saved, Father, because of our obedience. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Peter goes to Caesarea. You know, Cornelius has sent his folks to see him, a couple servants, and a, and a, and a trusted uh, soldier. I'm sure probably all God-fearing men he sent with him is what the scripture seems to indicate. And Peter comes down out of, he's had a vision, right? But we've had two <coughs> visions. Cornelius has had a vision. Peter's had a vision. Peter called these guys into the house and he's staying. Do you remember who's, who's he staying with? The tanner. Simon the Tanner, which is kind of miraculous in and of its own. No self-respecting uh, Pharisee would have ever been caught with a staying in a tanner's house because he was unclean, right? And it might have smelled a little bad because of some of the products they used to tan hides, which we won't cover ground. We've already been over, but, um, you know, some of it at that time was dog dung and on and on it goes. Definitely wasn't a place, you know, uh, um, it, was, it wasn't a Motel 6 where they left the light on, right? With clean sheets, probably. But Peter called them in and lodged them. And on the next day, Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. And the next day, after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for them and had called together his kinsmen and near friends. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter took him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. And he said unto them, You know that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or to come into, unto one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore came I unto you without objection as soon as I was sent for. 
I ask, therefore, for what intent have you sent me? And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting unto this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood there before me in bright clothing. He said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, thine alms are had in remembrance in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, call here Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodged in the house of one Simon a tanner, by the seaside, who, when he cometh, shall speak unto thee. Immediately, therefore, I sent to thee, and thou hast well done that thou art come. Now, therefore, as we are all here present before God, to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened his mouth. <laughs> I just love the way Luke, through the Spirit, leading him, says, Peter opened his mouth. You know, sometimes that's a scary thing. <laughs> But not so in this situation. And Peter said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John, pre which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all these things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. God, him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be the judge of living and dead. To him give all the prophets witness, and through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them who heard the word. And they of the circumcision who, who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues, magnify God, and then answered Peter, Can any man forget, forbid water that they should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then asked they him to tarry certain days. Man, there's a that's quite a whirlwind of activity in a in a four or five day period, right? These two guys, visions, taking road trips, going off with people you don't know, right? I mean, think about it. What's the odds of of a of a of a Jewish guy taking off with a Roman soldier voluntarily? God's doing something in this, right? Here we have a developing picture, really, of what the church is, is to be like. A mixture of people lodging together under one roof. No way should, should a Jew and Gentile lodge underneath the same roof, much less share a meal together. But we read that's what they did, right? Uh -huh. Do you think God has showed up in this story? Oh, goodness. Uh -huh. It's pretty cool. The faith of Cornelius' servants and, and, and the soldiers, I mean, it's just remarkable. We have people of different ethnic backgrounds, different social, um, seg from different segments of the social ladder, you might say, different economics, right? These people are coming together for one reason, and, and that reason is Jesus, the proclamation of the gospel, right? They've had a vision, two separate visions, but really one and the same. The vision is that God is on the move, right? And there's a shepherd that wants to lead them. This is a watershed moment. Peter shows great confidence in having them stay. Because we're going to read, you know, and, and you could go over to the book of Galatians, and I don't know if we'll get there today, I can't remember <coughs> what I got in my notes and what I don't. But, you know, at one time, Peter's going to step back from this, and Paul's going to rebuke him, right? He's going to find out the blessings of disobedience, right, when the Apostle Paul shows up. But that's a different sermon, okay? Verse 23, no delays. He called the man, lodged him. Next day, Peter went away with him. 
You know, obedience is the very best way to show that you believe. Doing what, exactly what the Lord commands, doing it joyfully. Action is the key. Do it immediately, and joy you will receive. We sang that in Bible Club, haven't we, boys? In camp. Obedience brings blessing when you're obeying what God wants you to do. And these certain brethren that went with them, right here, they don't tell us, okay? Peter went away, and he, and he says he, he, he brought some guys with him. But in Acts chapter 11, verse, um, verse 12, we find out who these people were because it's not going to be long afterwards, the next chapter, where Peter's going to have to vindicate this missions trip. Peter's going to have to give an account to some people who, who uh, weren't quite totally grasping the full meaning of grace, okay? And, and he says, the Spirit bade me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. So, you know, Scripture will interpret Scripture. And, and we see here that, that, that Peter took some six guys with him, and they went on this road trip. You know, Jesus in Matthew 18 says, if you have a dispute with somebody, take two or three witnesses and go deal with the dispute. I think Peter wanted to have his bases covered. Maybe he, maybe, the, maybe he knew in his heart that, hey, this is going to upset some people. So I, want, I don't want two witnesses. I don't want three. I want six because we're going we're gonna to come back and give a unified praise God, hallelujah, that God's doing something and he called us to do it. But there's many naysayers on the mission field. There's many naysayers in your life. There's many naysayers in my life. You know, when you're obedient to what God has you to do, there's going to be people that are going to come back one way, shape, or form and going to say, hey, you were wrong. Not only are you wrong, maybe you were stupid. You were ignorant. You were foolish. How could you do such a thing, right? Maybe you've heard it. Maybe you haven't. I certainly have. When I decided to go into forestry, I had fathers of some friends of mine when I was a young kid in high school saying to go into forestry and waste your money getting a degree uh, is stupid. You'll never get a job. It'll never work out. And I, I won't tell you the answer I gave them, but I, I told them I disagreed with them. And I probably wasn't very respectful. <laughs> but my forestry career, for the most part, worked out pretty good because that led me into a field of ministry. And then you go from a full-time job as, as a forester to you're going to go into faith missions. You know, we got a lot of hallelujahs, but there was definitely some people who said, what are you thinking of? How can you do such a thing? That is reckless. That is scandalous. Yep. That is stupid. You'll never pay the bills. Well, God proved them wrong. Because <laughs> here we are 22 plus years later, and God's still paying our bills. Now, I haven't missed a meal, obviously, okay? But obedience. Peter knew he was going to run into the naysayers. He knew the hearts of the people because the hearts of the naysayers had been his heart at one time, right? And the other apostles. You know, it's a struggle to relearn new ways of thinking and doing stuff, right? But in Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the studying and embracing the Word of God, and reading your Bible at least how many minutes every day, church? Five. At least five minutes every day. <laughs> you will find out God will do stuff to you, yeah. in you, and through you. Because the blessings of obedience are real and powerful. Because the Word of God is living, active, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews tells us, right? Well, Cornelius, he was excited. You know, he waited for them, verse 24, and he called together his kinsmen and near friends. You know, Cornelius was so excited, he had a house full, right? You know, he wanted people to hear. That tells us he was passionate about it, right? Mm -hmm. Just like Peter was passionate. Cornelius must have been persistent because he had a good reputation among the Jewish people. Peter was persistent. He was people-oriented. He invited people in. You know, God will do amazing things to us when we show a little obedience. We may not be the most flexible people in how we look at people and interpret life situations 
and we've come to our judgmental statements that we like to make, right? But God will work on that and change that. I love it that God can take our bad attitudes and turn them into his attitudes. You know? That's called growing in grace and knowledge, right? And obedience and holiness. He says, be holy because I'm holy, right? So to be holy is to be obedient. To obedience will lead to holiness. Cornelius was excited. In verse 25 through 27, you know, some commentators think maybe Peter's showing a little prejudice. I think he's just reminding them that, hey, you know, it's risky for me to be here, and it's risky for you to invite me in, because some people aren't going to like it. You know, even for the Jews, it was unlawful. It was against the law for, for the Jews to, to do what he was doing, to eat what he maybe was eating, and call any man common or unclean. Because what were the Pharisees known for? They were, they were known for calling most, you know, even the most uncommon man unclean, right? Because they called Jesus. They said, hey, it's by the power of the devil that you're casting out demons and working miracles and healing cripples, right? Peter wasn't prideful or, or puffed up. I don't think, and neither was Cornelius. Peter wasn't afraid to step out on the thin ice of, of ruffling the feathers of the, of, the, of the law keepers. And Cornelius obviously didn't care what some of his soldiers or even some of those above him thought. He says, I'm, I'm bringing this guy in because I want to hear and I want other people to hear. He wasn't afraid because it was two men meeting around the good news. And doesn't Jesus do that? The church would never, age would never have progressed as long as it has if people hadn't got together and broken barriers. I know God has broken barriers in your life because he's broken them in my life. He's broken the barriers of your thoughts. He's broken the barriers of your prejudices. He's broken the barriers of the sin that had you so easily entangled. And in some of that sin might be the sin of indifference or the sin of apathy. But Jesus is, you know, like that song, Chain Breaker. He's a way maker, you know. Peter was probably humming that even though he didn't know where that tune was coming from as he was walking up to Caesarea. Probably not, but anyways. Jesus likes to break barriers. He likes to smash bridges. And he likes to take down strongholds. And let me tell you what Jesus breaks. Don't try and super glue it back together. It's not productive. It's not a productive use of your time or talents. That's not his vision for you, is to rebuild what the Spirit has taken down. In verse 28, now we're going to, I think we're going to learn that, that Peter's learning legalism is not the way. Okay? Peter says, you know it's unlawful think for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation, but God has shown me I should not call any man common or unclean. You know, makes you think back to the, in the beginning, God created man and woman, heaven and earth, right? Male and female. In the image of God, and when God created mankind in his image, he said it was good or what? Very good. <clears throat> Cornelius then tells his story. Hey, I had this vision. I sent for you. You know, isn't that interesting? When, when, when God's on the move, sometimes he leaves us a little fog that he wants us to navigate. But sometimes he makes it so clear you can't miss it. Right? I think the more in tune you get with him, the more fog he might allow in. But Peter here was still early in his apostleship. You know, he had eight years. He'd had some good things happen. But God's like, Peter, I don't want you to miss it, you know? And Cornelius, I don't want you to miss it. And he lays it out there specifically. But just think of the people who were around them. Cornelius' household, Peter's household and friends, the other apostles when he went back, the other disciples, right? The, the, the deacons that are still doing their thing in Jerusalem and, 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 and around. This is a story we still tell today. And to hear the things commanded thee of God. Then Peter opened up his mouth, and we read this. He, God doesn't respect people, you know. I mean, he respects people, but he's not going to differentiate. He, he's, he's got a message for the world, right? And in every nation, he, in, 
the people that fear God and work righteousness will be accepted, you know. And he's preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He's Lord of all. The crossing of a great bridge here for Peter, a cultural statement. And you think, you know, as he's going on this trip, I wonder if he was a little nervous or apprehensive. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? What, who am I going to encounter? You know, Peter was human like us. He's probably, you know, probably wrestling with a few things as he's traveling up that road. I wonder if he thought back to another road trip he took, uh, John chapter 4. One of my most favorite stories in the Bible, and I got a lot of them, trust me. But John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Said, there cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away in the city to buy food. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, who am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Peter knew this story, right? <laughs> he was there. I mean, he wasn't there at this point in time, but he, he's coming back into the scene here later on. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou would have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Peter knew what it was like to stand there and watch Jesus step out and minister to someone who was, quote, unclean, unpopular, despised by most, right? Not only a Samaritan, but a woman. Of Samaria who didn't have the most stellar background and who's Peter going to see a Roman centurion there's a little bit of faith going on here amen mm -hmm. in John 18 28 this gives you an idea of, of, of what this going into the room of a of a, a Gentile was to a to a to a highfalutin Pharisee <laughs> 1828, this is the trial of Jesus. He's going before Caiaphas. Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas unto the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. You know, these guys are afraid to crucify Christ. They've conspired, they've lied, they're manipulating things. They're, they're okay with murder. They're, they're okay with cooking the books in the legal arena. But they don't want to go in the judgment hall because they want to eat the Passover. That's a terrible place to be. Peter didn't want to be in that place. He was living the Passover. He was living for the Passover lamb. He wasn't afraid to step over the threshold into the judgment hall of public opinion and go see Cornelius. In Acts 11.3, as I already said, this, this act of obedience was, was used to bring the charge of lawbreaking against Peter. In and, and Acts 11.3, they said, when he came up to Jerusalem, I'll just start reading in verse 1. The apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard, when they heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God, and was Peter come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and did eat with them. Peter was part of a great revival in this part of Caesarea, building upon the work of of probably Philip the Evangelist, who that was his home base, as we talked about. And they're concerned that he ate with some Gentiles. Doesn't say they praised God and shouted hallelujah and said, hey, let's send them some Old Testament scrolls so they can uh, learn more about the Savior, right? The blessings of obedience is always not understood by people who are outside the sphere of faith. Be wary of a legalistic mindset. You know, God wants to conform us to the image of Christ. 
He wants to renew our minds. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how does our mind get renewed, church? By spending at least five minutes a day in your Bible. I know you guys all... I, I tell you, I got some hobby horses, and that's one of them. Because that's a good horse to ride. God wants us to be conformed to the image of Christ, not to the expectations of the world or of each other. Be whom God wants you to be. Be whom God wants you to be. We're on different timelines to holiness, you know that? So we need to have some understanding, you know, right? We need to have some grace. Grace is an operative principle in our lives if we're following Christ. That doesn't mean you blow off willful, will, will, willful sin and just, you know, there's defiance and, and dereliction of duty and, and there's, you know, missing the mark. And God will reveal that to you too in your life and other people's. Because we're all going to screw up. Amen? You know, we're on different timelines to holiness, so if someone's lagging behind, help them out. But oftentimes in, in the church, maybe in your church background, you've lagged behind, and instead of helping out, you've been shamed out. You've been shamed out of the church because you messed up. You messed up intentionally, you messed up unintentionally. You messed up. And instead of people reaching out to pull you up, they reached out to close the door. And that's not what God wants. Seizing the invitation to share, verses 29 through 33, and we looked at that. That's what, that's what, that's what Cornelius did. He tells everyone about his vision, then he tells Peter. He says, get with it, boy. God brought you here. Let's hear it. You know, Cornelius, I think, had a great understanding of his need and of his household. And they knew that what Peter had to say, the things of God was important and they needed to be heard. And, and Peter gives him a little history lesson. The news of Jesus was known throughout the land. The story of the crucifixion was known throughout the land, okay? The upheaval in Jerusalem that it caused and that was coming was known throughout the land, okay? This was not a secret. But Cornelius was looking for the truth from, from an eyewitness. And, and God, you know, and he was responding to the vision God gave him from the angelic visitation. I think we learned from Cornelius and from Peter, when people are ready to hear the gospel, don't delay. When the Spirit tempts you, not tempts you, but leads you, you know, gives you that opportunity. I got to tell you a story of Loretta Ettinger. Loretta Ettinger was a gal I met coming back one, late one night in Helena. It was February. It wasn't like this year. It could have been January, but I remember it was like 10 below zero and the wind's blowing. And I, I'm driving to the gas station. I barely have enough gas to get to Helena. I drive my old 90, 1990 uh, Toyota pickup I had at the time. And uh, I see this young gal walking and the wind's blowing. And I had this thought, I thought, she's going to come up and ask me for money because she was heading towards the gas station too. So I kind of had a judgmental thought, right? I wasn't practicing what I'm preaching, at least at this moment when I'm pulling up to the gas pumps. I start pumping gas. Loretta comes up. I can tell, obviously, she is in distress, and she is stoned. She is higher than a kite. And... She asked if I'd give her a ride to where her apartment was. Now, I don't ever pick up single young women, you know, unless their cars broke down right there, but like right in downtown Helena, a gas station, I'm thinking like, but it, it's like 11 at night, 11.30. Nobody else is out. I'd been down, like I said, for a youth group and a Bible club. I was coming back from Tostin. And uh, so much to my surprise, the words that came out of my mouth, I'll give you a ride. So she got in my pickup, and we started driving, and I just started talking to her. And I said, uh, first thing I said to her, you know what it was? No I said, I said, hey, the Beatles sang about you. I got a song, one of the lines says, get back, Loretta. <laughs> she, she looked at me like, what? It was not registering, you know. So anyways, I moved on, so I started talking to her, asking her questions, and found out where she lived, took her to her apartment. But on the way, I started telling her about this guy named Jesus. 
and, and she started telling me a little bit about her life and, and and her life hadn't been too good up to that point and it still wasn't and I have no idea what it turned out since but I do know that we spent about maybe a half an hour in my pickup truck and I went through a little Gideon's Bible where I had the Romans road to salvation and went through it and talked about sin and talked about all the stuff you talk about and I said you know if you want your sins forgiven and you, and you want to have a chance to, to head in the right direction I said you can ask Jesus to be your Savior right now and I and I don't know what all I told her but I said you know your, your life uh, will get better but it may not happen overnight because you got you're in a mess and she goes, I'd like to do that. And I think she actually really meant it, you guys. And so we, we went through the gospel we, several times. And she prayed to ask Christ be her Savior. Then I went, kind of went back through it again. And, uh, but a couple days later, me and Lisa went back to her apartment. And uh, she opened the door. And I had some more literature I wanted to give her and talk with her with Lisa. And uh, she wasn't too interested. So I don't know, you know, maybe she got saved. Maybe she didn't. I don't know what happened. And uh, I went back a couple times to try and visit with her and, and uh, never caught her home. <coughs> One day I'm in Walmart and I hear Loretta Edinger come to the uh, customer service. I boogied up there as fast as I could and she was gone because I wanted to try and touch base with her. So I don't know what happened with Loretta. But at that time and for several days I thought, man, maybe she really got saved. But maybe she was so high she didn't understand. But you know what, when she woke up the next morning and came to her senses... She had a Bible with her, and she had a, 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 a New Tribes uh, Stranger on the Road to Emmaus Bible study with her, with a study book already filled out and answers in it, because I think I gave her my copy. So who knows what God did? But we'll find out one day. But when people are ready to hear the gospel, don't delay. Amen. You dropped okay? a packet of seeds. What's that? I said you dropped a whole packet of seeds. Yeah, a lot of seeds. <laughs> In verses 34 through 33, we have a synopsis of Acts chapter 2, 14 through 41 sermon in the book of Mark. You know, in 34 through, through 43, Peter opened up his mouth and he says, God's not a respecter of a person. And, and he says, you know, he's talking about Jesus. And he says, you know, verse 37, we get a history here. I, the word I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. And then God joined, anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, and power. He went about doing good, healing, all oppressed of the devil. We're witnesses of these things. Then he talks about the resurrection, verse 40. God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly. And he commanded us to preach, verse 42, the, to the people. To testify that he who was ordained by God to be the judge of the living dead, to which all the prophets uh, give testimony, you know. This is like the stranger on the road to Emmaus and like... Two minutes, right? I mean, sometimes you got a lot of time. Sometimes you don't have much time. But you got to know what you got. You got to know what they need to hear, right? And if you're obedient to the Spirit, and if you've been studying the Bible, and you know the Word, and you're prepared, you know, if you're prepared, opportunity shows up, right? And God will give you an, an opportunity. The eternal message of hope and freedom was what Peter gave him. Jesus paid it all, right? His message was simple. God's impartial. Jesus is Lord of all. We're sinners. We need to get saved. The prophets talk about them. You've got a decision to make. And like I said, racial prejudice is destroyed by the fire of the Spirit and the Word. That's what we get out of here. And the Holy Spirit fell on them, and, 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 and they were baptized, and they, they magnified God. They glorified God. So in closing here, I mean, there's more you could say. Can't cover every point in every sermon, right? We'll be here forever. And I'll confuse myself. I keep going too much longer. But the closer we get to being in God's will, the more confident we're going to be. I will amen that one. The closer you are to being in the will of God, the more confident you'll be. Because you'll be right where you're supposed to be. Okay? Double-mindedness leads to sin. A double-minded man, woman, boy or girl is unstable in all their ways. You know, Peter knew about double-mindedness the night Christ was betrayed. 
He was worried about keeping warm and denied Christ three times. And then he went out and wept bitterly. This is the same man. Now he's weeping joyfully because he's seen people enter the kingdom. Here we have Peter full of boldness and confidence. Again, spirit-led. Church, we got to be careful. Sometimes we want to put on our worldly glasses, our pragmatic glasses, our excuse-making glasses. Why we can't. We can't do this. We can't do that. We can't share. We can't devote any time to drawing closer to God so he'll draw close to us. We got cars to work on. We got meals to be made. We got things we got to clean up. We got TV shows to watch. We got a million excuses. When God's tugging at your heart to do whatever, whatever he's tugging you to do, you do. And I guarantee you, you'll never regret it. Because obedience is the way. Right? Obedience. Tell the story. It should be easy if it's written on your heart. Right? Give people the mega light. Give them Jesus. Right? No pleading and cajoling. When a person's ready to get saved, you don't need to talk them into it. The Holy Spirit's already called them, and God's pulled them to himself. You just get to be there when you, the, the deal gets finalized, you know. You're, you're a vessel used to accomplish his will. And that's important to remember, because it's God's work. Last but not least, you may be led to a place outside of your normal way of life to share Christ. My question for you is, will you do it? Will you do it? Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can look into the book of Acts, that we can read these stories, and they're more than stories, they're life, they're truth, they're Holy Spirit anointed stories, Lord. There are stories of, of um, eternal importance, Lord, because they they dwell upon, that they impact, Father, people's destinies. Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to be obedient, not so that we can be blessed, but so that others will be blessed when they come to know you, Lord. Help us to live our lives to be lives of obedience, Lord. Help us to be holy vessels and useful to you, Lord. Help us to be soul conscious like Peter was on this trip, Lord. And those with him, Lord, thank you for the men that went with him to encourage him, to testify with him, to support him, Lord. And that just shows that in the church we need each other. We need to uh, support each other. We need to be there for each other, Lord. Help us to be useful, Lord, both down here and, 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 uh, and in the halls of heaven. And it's in Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen.